Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, citizens of the planet Earth, thank you so much for uh, coming out here to Adelaide to the Royal Institution of Australia, or RI Oz, as one refers to it. Um, can I just, my name is Wilson De Silva, I'm an editor of Cosmos, uh, Australia's number one science magazine, winner of only 35 awards in the last five years, and uh, I will guide you today um, through something called the Drake Equation. Don't worry, it's uh, only a few number, and a few characters, and I explain it very slowly, so slowly that even I can understand it. Uh, as anyone knows, that a, journalists are kind of like trained chimpanzees, really. Um, can I just say that, uh, firstly, um, it's a pleasure to be in a city that so enjoys and adores and appreciates science that it, uh, it attracts this kind of crowd to a uh, talk that involves the word equation. <laughs> I'm very impressed. It's also um, a pleasure always to come to Adelaide because um, it's where the Royal Institution is based and the Australian Science Media Centre. And I've got to tell you, there's a lot of people in Sydney who are devilishly jealous of that. Um, so congratulations, Adelaide, for uh, hosting both of those organisations and being so far-sighted enough to uh, have them. And congratulations to the Royal Institution for, um, you know, doing such a fabulous job. And uh, so firstly, um, thank you very much for coming. And the question tonight is, as you can see, are we alone in the universe? It's a review of the Drake Equation. Um, let me ask you this question. What is a more shocking idea that thousands of alien civilizations um, are humming away in our galaxy right now or that we are all that there is, a solitary beacon of intelligence in a silent universe of almost incomprehensible vastness. I would suggest to you that either prospect um, was, is enough to catch your breath. Yet one of these statements is true. We just don't know which one. Um, that's not to say we don't know anything about the likelihood of intelligent life in the cosmos. In fact, we know for sure that it does exist. Um, the fact that we're here, not just in Adelaide, but on planet Earth, and the fact that we're here means that the probability of uh, intelligence arising is greater than zero. Uh, we just don't know how much greater than zero it is. It could be one in a million. It could be one in a billion. Or it could be a freak event uh, never to be repeated. Now, consider the numbers involved. Um, we live in a universe with billions upon billions of stars. Um, those of you will recognize a bit of Carl Sagan there. Did you know that Carl Sagan never actually said billions and billions? Um, as astronomer Carl Sagan once said, we can see more stars in the sky than there are grains of sand on the, all the beaches of our world. Many of these stars are very much like our own sun, and each may well have a brood of planets orbiting around it. The Milky Way galaxy, um, our own local neighbourhood in space, is not actually the Milky Way galaxy, but it's the same sort of spiral structure that you might see if you were able to travel 40,000 years above the Milky Way and look back on it. Um, it would take you quite a while. Um, the, our Milky Way galaxy uh, has... Um, at the lowest estimate, 100 billion stars or suns, and, and at the highest estimate, 400 billion suns. So, and, and think about this, the Milky Way is only one of millions of galaxies out there in the vast cold void of space. So even if the probability of intelligent life emerging is exceedingly small, um, the sheer number of stars in the heavens... Um, if you like, the, the sheer number of times the, the dice have been rolled uh, would suggest that um, we really are not alone. One man who tried to solve this uh, astronomical conundrum was Frank Drake, an American radio astronomer who now chairs the SETI Institute, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute in the United States, in California. Um, while working at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in West Virginia in the late 50s, um, he and a handful of young scientists, uh, he was actually 31 when he did this, um, became intrigued by the prospect of detecting evidence of extraterrestrial civilizations using the relatively new discipline of radio astronomy. On the 8th of April 1960, almost exactly 50 years ago, uh, he aimed a 26-metre uh, radio telescope at two nearby stars, uh, Tau Ceti and Epsilon Eridani, 
uh, Star Trek fans will know that Epsilon Eridani is where Vulcan is, and that's where Mr. Spock comes from. This was actually the first real um, radio search for, well, first real search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, his team devoted 200 hours to listening uh, to these two stars. And while there was some initial excitement um, when they picked up some military radar, um, there was a whoa, 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 whoa kind of sound happening, and uh, they got rather excited. Um, th th then they were able to discount it as military radar, but um, you know, nothing conclusive was detected. A year later, he was asked by the US National Academy of Sciences to convene a meeting of experts to explore the possibilities of civilizations beyond the Earth. Um, in preparing his agenda, he listed all of the questions that scientists would need to answer in order to predict the number of detectable civilizations in the galaxy. He then realized that um, if all of the questions uh, were multiplied together, you would uh, then estimate, have the estimate for the number of detectable civilizations. And so, the Drake equation was born. Now this is what you do in a magazine when you're trying to um, make mathematics look really sexy and interesting. Uh, we did a story in the Drake equation and we thought, how do, you, how do you make a bunch of equations look fantastic and this is how you do it. A little bit of color, a little bit of excitement, a little bit of a few icons. Okay, um, so the Drake equation of born, was born. Ever since that day in 1961, Drake and a number of his colleagues have spent uh, a chunk of their careers uh, looking for evidence that ET might be out there. Now while that evidence has yet to arrive, his equation lives on as a simple yet powerful tool um, that helps us to understand what we need to know in order to solve this fundamental, even existential, dilemma. Um, and thanks to the new scientific data uh, collected in, almost, you know, in the almost 50 years since it was first devised, we can actually update the question tonight um, and get closer to an answer. And that will be, we will develop this as I go and Let's see what we think of the answer at the end. So um, what's the equation? As you can see there, it's N equals Rx times Fp times Ne times Fl times Fi times Fc times L. What the hell does that mean? Well, that's what I'm going to show you. So Rx, the first term of the Drake equation, refers to the yearly rate of star formation in our galaxy and lays the foundation for the rest of the equation. Back in 1961, Frank Drake... Um, his original estimate was for Rx was a modest 10 per year. Stellar formation is actually one of the hot topics in astronomy right now. By studying star formation in distant galaxies, earlier, younger galaxies, um, astronomers can observe models of what our own Milky Way might have been like in its infancy. The current best guess uh, is that f star formation in the Milky Way, Milky Way sorry, runs at between 1 and 10 solar masses a year. A recent study in the British journal Nature uh, has been rather more specific. It looked at gamma waves uh, emitted from exploding stars in stellar nurseries. These are regions where stars are born. Now, gamma rays can penetrate the um, thick clouds of gas in these regions, which often block our view. The study concluded that stellar formation in the Milky Way, if you use uh, analogous um, galaxies, was rolling along at probably at a reasonable rate of uh, seven solar masses a year. Um, isn't that cool to think there are seven stars born every year, manufactured, large, huge, boiling, broiling um, balls of fire? Kind of cool. All nuclear powered, by the way. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that there are seven individual stars, though, formed every year. Uh, it just means the amount of gas equal to seven times the mass of our sun, uh, collapses to form new stars annually, annually in the, in the Earth's sense. Uh, most new stars are very small, much smaller than our sun, and uh, more massive stars are rather rarer and uh, only last a few million years. This means that only a relatively small proportion of new stars, perhaps as low as 2%, uh, will be like our sun. This is on the basis that um, life tends to evolve around stars like our sun, which is a bias because we live around a star that's like our sun. Um, and more recently, in the last 20 or 30 years, we've discovered there are actually planets um, orbiting binary stars and orbiting stars that have nothing to do like our sun, um, like Gliese 581d that's actually a dwarf, a red dwarf. Um, so 
only um, if, uh, as I was saying, if it's only a relatively small portion of stars, perhaps as low as 2% will be like our sun. If that's the case, then the real value of Rx, looking at stars like our sun, trying to be conservative, uh, the yearly rate of star formation in our galaxy for stars like our sun could be anywhere between 7 and 0 0.14 solar masses a year. OK, the next term in the equation um, is Fp, or the fraction of stars that actually have planetary systems. Um, in 1961, no planets had actually ever been detected outside of our solar system. And in fact, they actually had nine planets orbiting the solar system then. And apparently, we only have eight now since kick <laughs> Pluto was kicked out. Um, but we, uh, they did know that around half of all stars were binary systems, uh, where two stars are locked in orbit around each other. And at that time, it was considered that uh, binary systems were unlikely candidates for planetary systems. As a result, Drake's original estimate for FP was a re relatively straightforward um, half of 1%. However, we no longer have to wildly speculate about the existence of extrasolar planets. One of the coolest discoveries in astronomy in the 20th century was finally the detection of extrasolar planets in uh, 1995. As of yesterday, there were 446 extra extrasolar planets. That's planets beyond our solar system, uh, with more being detected every month. As of this morning, another nine have been found. Um, this lends credence to the argument that many stars harbor planetary systems. But the question remains, what proportion of uh, stars actually have planets? One of the leading experts in extrasolar planets is Jeffrey Marcy, a professor of astronomy at the University of California, Berkeley. He estimates that uh, of the new 2,000 nearest stars to us, about 7% have planets we can detect. Um, not planets that exist, mind you, um, just those that we can actually detect. And remember that most of the planets discovered so far are very large, like you know, Jupiter-like gas giants, which are easier for astronomers to spot. Uh, most of them have been spotted by um, uh, a kind of a wobble method where you have a star that kind of vibrates slightly and wobbles, in effect, and you work out the, um, that it has planets around it, which is what makes it wobble. And then you can actually work out how many of those planets and therefore the distance, rough distance from their home star is, and that's how you work out the planets. Um, However, the very common occurrence of protoplanetary disks around young stars suggests that this number uh, might actually be higher. That something like three quarters of the 2,000 local stars, the nearest stars to us, might actually have planets. Um, the problem is most of the planets may be too small to detect with existing techniques. Although there's um, some new orbiting facilities like the Kepler telescope recently launched, uh, that are extending the range of what we can see. And uh, I'm very excited to, to see what the follow-up to Hubble, uh, the James Webb Telescope in 2015, will be able to uh, spot. As for FP, according to Marcy's, Jeffrey Marcy's best guess, the fraction of stars that have planets is probably around 70%, plus or minus 10%. You know, scientists are always want to have an error bar. Uh, that makes our value for FP a little higher than Drake's original equation. Okay, so now that we've got planets, okay, how many of those planets are actually habitable? Um, the next step, it's kind of the next step, so can they support life? Um, this is represented by the term Ne in the equation and was originally estimated at two by Drake. When Drake made his estimate, the only model we had of a habitable planet was Earth, with Mars as an outside contender. Um, these two planets lie within the continuously habitable zone, uh, an area around a star where surface temperatures on any planet are within the tolerable limits for life, at least life as we know it. Um, this is sometimes called the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, but just right. However, Earth-like planets in the Goldilocks zone might not be the only contenders for uh, supporting life. According to Jeremy Bailey of the Australian Centre for Astrobiology in Sydney, uh, part of the University of New South Wales, there are questions about how Earth-like a terrestrial planet really needs to be and whether or not life would only occur or arise on Earth-like planets. Locations where life may occur in our own solar system 
um, now include the Jovian moon of Europa and Saturn's moon Enceladus. Both moons show hints of subsurface bodies of liquid water heated by the tidal compression they experience as they orbit their, as they orbit their titanic mother worlds. Ever since um, scientists discovered exotic life forms of deep ocean volcanic vents and uh, living on the surface of salt crystals and frozen you know, for 20,000 years or 200,000 years, I think was the, the um, latest uh, estimate, uh, and, and actually you know, could be reanimated. Ever since then, um, the idea that life might survive in conditions that were considered once hostile to life, uh, you know, it's gained a lot of credence and it's widely accepted. Um, there's still a lot we don't know about extrasolar planets, so it's difficult to put an exact figure on NE. All we know is that some systems might have one or more planet, planets in the Goldilocks zone, as well as several moons that resemble Europa and Enceladus, which are orbiting gas giants. Interestingly, Avatar, um, the, now the biggest blockbuster film ever, uh, is uh, the planet, or uh, well, the uh, world that they visit is called Pandora, which is a moon orbiting a gas giant. Uh, in the nearest uh, Alpha Centauri A. So um, kind of nice to see science making it uh, the big screen like that, and relatively accurately too. Our estimate for N E there, N E there, sorry, our estimate for N E would therefore lie somewhere between a conservative one and Drake's original estimate of two. You can see I'm being quite conservative <laughs> as I'm going through this. Okay. <coughs> How many worlds actually have life? You know, or, mo or moons. Um, once you, you can have potential for life, but how many actually do support life? This is represented by FL in the, term, in, the, uh, in, the ter in the Drake equation. Drake's original estimate was an optimistic 100%. If a planet or a world can support life, life arises. Uh, this is based on the fact that on Earth, life sprang up fairly fast, as soon as it could, in fact. Um, it's therefore reasonable to assume, Drake argued, that given the appropriate conditions, life eventually pops up. Hence, if there are other planets in the galaxy similar to Earth, and it's likely, perhaps even inevitable, um, that uh, they will also, the life will also appear on them. This argument is uh, a popular one among scientists today. Um, but the probability that biogenesis on any Earth-like world happens 100% of the time, has been challenged by a number of other scientists, including uh, astronomer Charlie Lineweaver of the Planetary Science Institute in Canberra, part of the ANU. Lineweaver and his doctoral student Tamara Davis, in a scientific paper not too long ago, argued that the, the figure is probably a lot lower. Uh, drawing on our limited knowledge of biogenesis here on Earth, um, they ran a probabilistic analysis of the chances of life occurring on an Earth-like planet elsewhere and found it to be something like 13%. Now, others dispute this, um, arguing there's still a lot of controversy over the date of the earliest evidence on life here um, and of the early history of our planet, which would influence our understanding of how long that, um, it took for life to appear in the first place. It's possible the bombardment of Earth by meteors and comets um, provided a key component uh, needed for life, such as organic molecules, or even imported life itself from elsewhere. Uh, this is panspermia, the concept. To settle this point, uh, we need one of two things. We need to find a second example of life in the solar system. Would you mind arranging that for us, please? Um, such as Mars or Europa, or on planets of nearby stars. Uh, it only needs to be microbial life. It doesn't have to be walking, talking, you know, uh, coffee drinking uh, aliens. Um, it just needs to be microbial life, but we need to have life that originated independently of life on Earth. Two such, two such occurrences close together would be convincing evidence that life forms pretty easily arise given the right conditions. And therefore, we probably, we probably live in a universe that's teeming with life. The other way we could solve the problem is if we could come up with a convincing understanding of how life first arose, perhaps even duplicating the process in the laboratory. To date, scientists have yet to artificially create an organism from the basic building blocks of life. But there are some exciting um, experiments underway, in particular Gerald Joyce's lab at the Scripps Research Institute in San Diego, which I visited earlier this year. Um, they have managed to s synthesize RNA enzymes which can replicate themselves without the help of any proteins or other cellular matter. Um, just to 
drive home the point. That's biology. Um, that's no biology at all. It's kind of no proteins, no cells, no biological matter. It's early days, but um, this is getting closer to answering um, the question, can life arise from nothing but a chaotic assortment of uh, basic molecules? Pretty exciting. Ultimately, though, all we know today is that life appeared here on Earth uh, a few billion years ago, and that conditions on Earth are likely to be replicated to a greater or lesser degree uh, on other terrestrial planets in our galaxy. So the answer to FL, the probability that life arising on a world where, which can support life, being 100% of the time, may be optimistic. It's more feasible, perhaps, to answer somewhere between Line Weaver's pessimistic 13% and perhaps... Um, um, you know, uh, 100%, which is Drake thought. So maybe, say, 50%. Okay, how many planets actually have intelligent life and cities and flying cars? Um, if life arises on a planet, does it necessarily mean that we have, we lead to intelligent life? Does, it, does evolution naturally take that course? Drake made a very conservative estimate um, for this figure in 1961. Uh, he thought that 1% of all planets where life arose actually generated intelligence. Um, like questions about the genesis of life from non-life, we have only a single example of intelligent life on Earth, and that's us. Some would even doubt that. This indicates that the probability of intelligence arising is greater than zero, but there's fierce contention over how much greater than zero that number really is. Um, although scientists feel confident they understand the process of evolution, uh, they have no idea if they can predict how evolution might unfold in other worlds. There's actually a, a fabulous story in the current issue of Cosmos, which I'd recommend um, looking at what evolution might generate on, on kind of bizarre planets by Lewis Dartnell, who's an astrobiologist. There are currently two main models um, in the argument about how life might evolve elsewhere, and they, um, and they offer different predictions for the likelihood of intelligence evolving. The first was promoted by the renowned US paleontologist, the late Stephen Jay Gould. He suggested that evolution is primarily guided by chance. Um, if correct, two planets with similar conditions could actually have wildly different evolutionary histories. Uh, we could therefore expect life on other planets to be completely different from life on Earth, and it's highly unlikely it would result in anything like creatures with two arms, two legs, and a distinct interest in beer. The other model is proposed by Simon Conway Morris, a paleobiologist at the University of Cambridge, who suggests that convergence is a dominant guiding force in evolution. Uh, this is the belief that evolution naturally selects towards a relatively small set of uh, successful solutions to common problems. Examples on Earth include stereoscopic vision, wings, and protective spines, all of which have uh, evolved independently in a wide range of species. Uh, the question is whether intelligence is one of these convergent solutions uh, and therefore likely, maybe even certain, um, to arise given sufficient time. Now, one way to test this hypothesis um, that intelligence is common, uh, always arises, is to examine cases in which it has done so compared with those cases where it has failed to arise. Now, uh, cosmologist Paul Davies did his own thought experiment in this, and it's a really cool idea. Um, he says it's kind of already taken place on Earth uh, due to the fact that continents have been isolated from each other, acting like planets with similar conditions. Uh, intelligence involved on only one of those continents, Africa. Um, so the odds would have to be less than one in five, he argues. Also, intelligence took a long time to evolve. Why didn't it happen 200 million years ago? Um, this suggests that even if all the favourable conditions are in place, intelligence is still a, a difficult step. Um, this leads Davis to, Davies to estimate that um, the odds of intelligence arising is no greater than one in a million for every hundred million years of evolution in a benign environment. That would put our figure for FI, the number of habitable planets where intelligence actually arises, uh, somewhere between Drake's original 1% and a slightly more optimistic 2.5%. OK. Let's say intelligent civilizations actually exist and they're out there right now. How do we de detect them? Uh, because if we can't detect them, we'll never know they're there. 
Drake was interested in using radio astronomy to seek out extraterrestrial civilizations. So his original formulation of the equation factored in the likelihood that they would communicate in ways that we could detect, uh, represented by FC, and he estimated this at 1%. Back in the 1960s, it was widely believed that radio would be the communications technology of choice for an advanced civilization. I don't mean radio as in hits from coast to coast. I mean radio as a spectrum, OK? Um, so uh, whether we're talking about um, deliberate broadcasts into space, so-called um, uh, beacons, or leakage of their own communications, planetary communications. Uh, in fact, our own planet has been telegraphing evidence of our technological civilization for nearly 80 years. There are hundreds of stars within 80 light years of Earth that could conceivably have a life and even now could be turning into um, everything from I Love Lucy to Skippy the Bush Kangaroo, which may explain why we haven't been contacted. <laughs> Much has been written about the possibility of detecting a civilization by radio, including the most likely um, frequencies uh, to tune into and the relative strength of signals required to penetrate the natural uh, interference permitting the noisy voids of space never mind the atmosphere or our noisy 21st century communications. Um, but would other intelligent civilizations even use radio? Um, perhaps it's too passe for them, like smoke signals are to us. Uh, just because we use radio doesn't mean it's still in fashion. After all, um, we've only had it for a century. What's radio to a civilization that's um, had it for 100,000 years? There may well be far more superior forms of communication that we are yet to discover and which don't leak signals into space. Um, there's also the possibility that an alien civilization would deliberately mask its presence from its neighbours. Um, you can make a case that um, some civilizations may be hostile. Um, therefore, betraying your existence to them may not be too smart. Um, other civilizations, if they exist, may have arrived at this conclusion and uh, made their communications hard to detect. Paul Davies makes a, similistic a similar pessimistic estimate for the number of detectable civilizations. He reckons no more than one in a thousand. Uh, that would place our value of FC somewhere between Drake's original 1% and um, Davies' estimate of one in a thousand. OK. The final term in the Drake equation is a little bit depressing. Um, and it's probably the hardest to estimate. What's the average length of time a technological civilization uh, stays detectable? We know that intelligent species can survive for well over 100,000 years, as Homo sapiens have um, already managed to do. However, humans have only had civilization for 10,000 years. And we've only really been detectable for the last 100 years. Drake himself was worried that an advanced civilization might not be detectable for very long. The easiest way to detect um, our existence is to listen to our numerous TV broadcasts, which leak from Earth and travel forever into the outer void. But they also f uh, fade away um, with distance, but they fade away as we change, we switch over to cable and satellite transmissions directly to the home. It's possible that many civilizations um, are easily detectable for only a short period of time, uh, even though they continue to thrive for thousands and thousands and millions of years. On the dark side, there's also the question of whether intelligent species um, can survive the onset of industrial and technological revolutions. Uh, it's possible that developing technology advanced enough to make a civilization detectable also coincides with the development of technology that could wipe it out in a holocaust, um, such as war, climate change, um, runaway nanotechnology. Um, there's also, you know, natural calamities um, like ice ages, super volcanoes and asteroid strikes like the one that put an end to um, the reign of dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Larry Niven, the science fiction writer, is, uh, uh, loves to quote the fact that the, um, the reason the dinosaurs died is because, because they didn't have a space program. The statistics could be totally skewed by the few civilizations then that make it through the bottleneck of technological infancy into the kind of post-industrial, post-warlike, post-superstitious age. Um, it could mean that as many as nine out of every ten civilizations might die off within, say, 200 years of becoming detectable. On the other hand, 
uh, one in ten might make it through to the other side and survive for thousands or millions of years. Um, Davies believes that if we humans successfully pass this bottleneck we're experiencing, uh, a combination of genetic engineering and artificial intelligence uh, may allow human civilization to essentially last forever. Um, if the same is true elsewhere, then the history of intelligence in the universe will be completely dominated by a, a, f a handful of survivor civilizations. Can you see the show now? If then one in ten civilizations lasts for 100,000 years, that would make our estimate for L uh, about 10,000 years, which incident, interestingly enough corresponds to Drake's original estimate in 1961. A more optimistic calculation where at least a few civilizations um, last for millions of years uh, could place the number for L at about 200,000. Okay, so what's the answer? Uh, now that we have all the terms of the Drake equation at hand, we can make our estimates for N, the number of detectable extraterrestrial civilizations that are out there in our galaxy right now. According to Drake's original calculations in 1961, n equaled somewhere between 4 and 10. However, revising many of Drake's estimates with the latest scientific knowledge, we get a different result. Now remember, 4 and 10 is detectable civilizations. It's not the number of civilizations, it's the ones that we might be able to detect with all these filters run, running through it. Okay, let, well, let's punch in our most conservative estimates into the Drake equation, including very low estimates for sun-like star formation and fraction of planets that have life, uh, we arrive with a new figure for N of a very low 0 0.00127. Okay, what the hell does that mean? Well, firstly, it's not 42. Uh, it means that during any 100,000 year period in our galaxy's history, uh, around 127 detectable civilizations uh, will crop up. Uh, it may not sound too bad, but it actually um, makes the odds of us tracking and finding one of them um, really, really hard, uh, especially within the few hundred years of looking. Um, the chances are actually minimal at best. Uh, our more optimistic estimate is more encouraging, where N equals about 245 civilizations in any 100,000 year period. Um, even so, the galaxy is a big place, uh, and there's no telling where extraterrestrial civilizations uh, might appear. Um, so how do our scientists feel about the numbers? Mostly they're cautiously pessimistic. Um, some say the evidence is not encouraging, others are not so convinced that detectable civilizations can be found, even, in, even if intelligent life does exist and is abundant throughout the galaxy. Still others are hopeful that detectable civilizations are out there, but they're not so sure how long they'll last. So despite this wave of optimism, a glimmer of hope does remain in the hearts of many scientists. Um, take Paul Davies. He told me, um, I hope we are not alone. I would find that a depressing prospect. But the truth is, we simply don't know. Okay, Drake himself uh, maintains an air of optimism. Um, he has a strong conviction, a con conviction that extraterrestrial civilizations ex exist in our galaxy today. He estimates that there are about 10,000 of them in the Milky Way right now, which sounds like a lot, right? Um, but he made an interesting point when I interviewed him in February this year. Even if all of them were detectable, which is a challenge, you know, uh, since the, they may not want to be, may have gone digital and radio quiet or whatever, it would still take a long time to find even one. It's basically a numbers game. If our galaxy has a minimum of 100 billion stars, the low ball estimate, um, and there are 10,000 extraterrestrial civilizations out there, then you need to search 10 million stars before you start to worry that they ain't so common. Um, even with a low estimate for N, the number of detectable civilizations in the galaxy, it seems reasonable that there should have been enough civilizations in our galactic history to leave some kind of evidence of their passing. Radio waves travel at the speed of light, so we could theoretically detect the presence of a civilization that lived halfway across the galaxy and died out thousands of years ago. Uh, there's also the possibility that a few civilizations will last for many millions of years, so they'd still be kicking around. So, where is everyone? Why the silence? As some um, sci as scientists will tell you, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. There can be many reasons why we have not heard or seen them. Um, the universe is really, 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 really big. 
Um, space travel is extraordinarily slow and restricted as far as we know by the speed of light, about 300,000 kilometres a second. Drake told me that um, if you calculate the energy that's required to, for interstellar travel, based on the technology we have, you know, even the, the best technology we have, um, travelling between stars would take up the energy consumption of a planet for several, a whole planet for, you know, several years. So why would a civilization with our level of technology invest that kind of, um, that kind of energy? You, you kind of, that doesn't make sense. Um, even travelling at this speed, though, travelling at the speed of light, it would take more than four years to reach the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. We can't even travel the speed of light. I think the fastest is 10% 10, 10 of the speed of light. Uh, Alpha Centauri is the pointer star in the Southern Cross. It would take 40,000 years to get to, uh, to cross the galaxy. The fastest vehicles ever built, the Pioneer and Voyager space probes that so majestically um, imaged the outer planets in the 70s and 80s, uh, began their journeys, journeys in the 70s. Now, Voyager 1, travelling at 61,000 kilometres an hour, is now 16.9 billion kilometres from Earth and only just about getting ready to exit the solar system. So, uh, as you can see, space is very, very big. Then there's the fact that radio signals get weaker and weaker as they travel from their source. So even if alien TV and radio was pumping out across the galaxy, uh, we would only detect those in the very nearest stars. Only a very powerful beacon intended to be found by new civilizations could be detected by us. Um, but just sending such a signal which would, be, would be extremely difficult and expensive. Um, and why would you do it? Um, there's another, something called the Berserker Hypothesis. According to this view, the first civilization to travel into space sent out probes to wipe out any emerging and potentially competing life forms in the galaxy. If this is true, then TV signals may have given us away and a flotilla of alien warships could at this very moment be on its way to Earth. Okay. Another reason we may not have detected alien intelligence is, of course, that um, we are indeed alone. Uh, we have no evidence that the Earth is unique, but we do have evidence that it is rare. Um, one example is the presence of our moon. No other rocky planets in our solar system, at least, have uh, natural satellites so large as our moon, 25% of the Earth's mass. Uh, the presence of the moon may have contributed to stabilising the Earth's tilt and rotation, contributing to our relatively mild seasons and calm weather patterns, um, as well as tides and plate tectonics. Earth has also has uh, just the right kind of chemical composition and metallic core to generate a powerful magnetic field, uh, which protects the biosphere from potentially lethal cosmic radiation from space. Um, it's possible that these and other features played a key role in the origins of life um, and of the maintenance of an environment suitable for the evolution of intelligence. If that's the case, then other Earth-like planets without the very same combination of features may end up barren of life altogether, like Mars. If this is true, intelligent life could exist in our galaxy, but it would be so uncommon that there'd be very little chance that we'd ever detect each other. Um, if civilizations are very rare, then it will, they will be so far apart that we'll probably be forever isolated from each other, which is kind of sad, isn't it? Whether we live in a galaxy populated by dozens or even hundreds of advanced civilizations, or whether life on Earth is a freak occurrence never to be repeated, I would uh, say I would suggest that the implications are fairly staggering. Um, perhaps the most intriguing fact in this whole discussion is that there is an answer to, as to whether or not we're alone in the universe. Either we are a single musical note in a boundless but lonely universe or we are one of the many voices in a vast chorus. If we are alone in the cosmos, we have an obligation to ensure that our spark of intelligence is not lost, that we protect life on our planet. But I would argue we uh, also have an obligation to ensure the survival of humanity by expanding beyond the planet. Um, you can be sure that one day a massive calamity will befall our world, uh, an asteroid or a common impact, solar burst, nuclear war, whatever it may be. And uh, we could disappear or our civilization could fall. If we pass into history, it's not just a tragedy for us, I would argue, but also one for nature, because without us, there is no one to witness its infinite beauty, no one to marvel at a sunset or revel in a mountain view or thrill at the breaking of a wave on a beach. 
I'm getting poetical, but actually Carl Sagan did it first. We are a way for the universe to know itself. Um, but we also deserve to continue because we have created things that are greater than ourselves. This is now getting, my getting editorialising, getting excited and poetic. Um, not just scientific and technical knowledge, as valuable as they are, but also we've created new and beautiful ways to see the world um, through art, music, literature, performance. If it turns out we are not alone and the cosmos is humming with other advanced civilizations, we also have a duty to exist and to expand for I th you know, we're we unique in the universe. Think of the plays of Shakespeare, the symphonies of Bach, the philosophies of Confucius, poetry of Virgil, rhythms of didgeridoo, everything, and everything Leonardo da Vinci ever did. I mean, you know, nature in its diversity has made us what we are, and we too are children of the cosmos and have something to contribute. Perhaps we have an obligation to the cosmos to ensure that we not only survive, but thrive, as well as all the other species on our planet. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.